thrilled to host Dr. Shalendra Mehta, who will speak on Thank free you. speech and academic freedom in India and the West. With a few announcements, um, we are videotaping this event, and it will be posted publicly to the ODL website. So if you're uncomfortable being in the video, just sit towards the back. Um, and then if, if you folks can just sign in on the clipboard going around, it gives us a sense of who's here and how we can better serve you. Um, and uh, for those who missed Lou Guinier's X talk earlier this month, it is on the ODL website. You can get part of that from there. Um, just want to introduce you to uh, Professor Shalendra Mehta. He's the director and president of MICA, a graduate school of business and management in Ahmedabad, India. He taught at Purdue for 16 years and brought in multiple grants with various corporate partners. And he's an award-winning teacher. Um, student nominated awards, and he's taught all over the globe. So I'm thrilled that you're here. Please join me in a warm welcome. To the Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, I would uh, today speak about uh, traditions of academic freedom and freedom of speech uh, in the true uh, in the two traditions of India and the West. And uh, the 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 topic, of course, has always been of interest. But especially today, uh, when there is so much of friction around many of these issues, I thought it would be useful to provide another perspective, uh, the perspective which compares India and the West. And in the process, I'll share with you some new data that I think may be thought provoking. So basically, the plan for the talk is I want to talk about two parallel streams. Um, I will, for comparison's sake, talk about the West, and in particular, uh, the episodes relating to Socrates, Christ, Kant, Mill, the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and Bertrand Russell. And similarly, on the Indian side, I'll share with you how all these issues were handled across time and across space, in particular, using data that we have compiled on uh, 45 dynasties, which pretty much covers a 2,000-year span in Indian history. Um, and uh, in particular, how they handled some of these issues, uh, compiling some of the epigraphic evidence. And there's a, a very interesting uh, eyewitness account of how some of these conversations and debates basically happened, including one from a Chinese visitor who's very famous, and we'll talk about that. And then also some uh, thoughts from uh, the, the Muslim contact with India, in particular with Akbar and Dara Shikoh. So, uh, that is the, is the broad plan. And I will also talk about the philosophical underpinnings. In particular, uh, in the West, as you know, the philosophical underpinnings come from the Enlightenment. And uh, the Western model basically uh, has three parts, roughly. The ceremonial state church, that is what you find in uh, Britain and uh, Sweden, for example. A separation of church and state, which is what you find in um, America, for example. And then the laicite, right, the French model. And then the Indian model, which also goes into the philosophical traditions of the Veda, the Upanishads, the Edicts of Ashoka, the debates, and uh, I'll sum up with what the Indian model looks like, so to speak. So this is, if you will, uh, the broad plan. And as I said, I'll share with you some new data and also link up with uh, data that is already well known, which will give you a much better sense of how and why things progressed into traditions. Now, by the way, when you talk about freedom of speech and academic freedom, it broadly pertains to four areas of friction, in that order, roughly. The most contentious has always been religion and remains to this day. Uh, the second most contentious part becomes the social, aspect, the social uh, arena. The third is the political arena. And then, of course, for a certain period, especially around the time of Galileo, uh, continuing to debates around creationism, uh, there is the issue of free speech around scientific uh, freedom. So we'll touch upon, we won't touch upon uh, the political aspect so much, but I will have something to say about social and scientific uh, freedoms in the two traditions. Uh, and certainly I'll say a lot about uh, the religious issues because they tend to uh, continue to be contentious. Okay. Any questions on this uh, schema? Okay. So, uh, so uh, in, in, a, in a book, uh, Milconian recently said, can anything new be said about uh, freedom of speech and academic freedom? You know, he said, if you put in ancient Greeks, Kant, Mill, uh, sorry, it should be Holmes, not Holmes, uh, and Tocqueville and Spinoza, 
uh, what more can be said. I will argue that a lot more can be said and that is what I hope to do, do in this uh, piece. So let's start with um, uh, Greece, you know, which was considered by Nakamura and literally everybody as the birthplace of Western thought. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the pivotal figure there, of course, is Socrates, because uh, Whitehead famously said the history of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. And Plato says that everything good and beautiful uh, that he came up with, uh, Kalos, Kai, Neos, uh, the, the beautiful and new, is because of Socrates. So Socrates is the pivotal figure in Western thought. And here is what happened to Socrates. This is the famous uh, picture of uh, well, the painting that hangs in the Museum of Modern Art in New York by uh, Jacques-Louis David. This is the uh, famous uh, death of Socrates. And what is, so why was he condemned to drink uh, poison or hemlock? And it's kind of interesting. If you go back and uh, look at the original charge sheet against Socrates, uh, and I looked at it, and by the way, it's very interesting that this charge sheet uh, was memorialized and inscribed on a wall in Athens and stayed there for six centuries. From uh, roughly the fourth century BC to the third century AD, it was there. And what was that charge sheet? The charge sheet was that he corrupts the youth, but the most important thing is that he believes in other new spiritual beings. And in Greek, the, the, uh, the words are hetera de daimonia kaina. Now, daimon, Demon, that's the word in English for spirit or ghost. Demon actually meant the soul. Daimon in um, Greek meant the soul. So essentially, uh, he was uh, charged with uh, believing in other gods, gods that the city did not sanction. So we tend to uh, not look into this uh, very closely. I mean, certainly uh, scholars of classical Greek are well aware of the issues. But when people talk about um, uh, Socrates and his death, people mostly focus on the corrupting the youth part. But really, the charge of believing uh, other new uh, spiritual beings, and another word that was used was asabia, that is uh, blasphemy, basically. So really, the charge against Socrates was blasphemy, that he was promoting uh, worship of other gods, as it says very clearly in the Greek. Now, the other irony is that we look at uh, Greece as the birthplace of Western democracy, but again, if you look at uh, the work of Hansen, the Swedish uh, scholar of classics, uh, he says that uh, out of a population of roughly 250,000 or 300,000, only 30,000 really were eligible to vote. The others were slaves or women and children, and so they didn't. So there's this tension that happens, uh, even in terms of political freedom, uh, that I'm not going to touch upon. Same with uh, Christ. As you know, Christ was uh, crucified for blasphemy, for claiming, as uh, it says very clearly in Mark, that he was the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and the son of God. So basically, he was also crucified for blasphemy. So Mill basically talk, sums this up very well. He said, the two central figures in the development of Western thought, this is John Stuart Mill, were both put to death for blasphemy. I mean, it's pretty striking. We tend not to, and both in some sense were victims of free speech. That they could not exercise, Socrates could not exercise his right to discuss new divinities, and Christ could not exercise his right to claim that he was divine. Uh, so this is pretty, when you, when you look at it this way, it's pretty, pretty striking. Uh, now, uh, the, here is the irony. So, yes, please. I have a question. Yes. That right to free speech, was that very clear at that point of time? No. Was it no, it was not. It was not. That is precisely the point. In fact, there were very clear tripwires. That is, if you, if you crossed that religious tripwire, you could be immediately sanctioned with your life. So, it is not there. I mean, there is a tripwire. By the way, this is very interesting. There is, by the way, on every slide, there are, hi. On ev with every slide, I can go into a detailed discussion. We can be here all day and discuss it in detail. So since you've asked this question, let me share with you something very interesting that Libanius, uh, who was another Greek uh, scholar, this time in Byzantium, 
uh, sometime around the third century AD. He says that uh, Athens was not known for its agricultural productivity. It was a pretty barren place. So he said people don't come to Athens for uh, trade. People don't come for the natural beauty or anything like that. People come because Athens has free speech. Yet the irony is that it did not. It had with very strong limits that you could as long as you did not cross the line. And I'll show you several examples going through Western thought that as long as you stayed on one side of the line, you were fine. But the moment you uh, exercise free speech and go on beyond that line, you could pay with your life. Okay, yes. Is this mostly Athenian democracy? Or does this also apply to Corinthos and Sparta? And no, Sparta were, were of course much more repressive. So Athens was the most liberal, right. but uh, the other uh, oh, Greek yeah. states, yeah, yeah, they were much more repressive. So Athens is where you need to go. Ionia or Athens is where you need to go. Okay, so liberty, so why is liberty so important? Now, Mill makes, again makes the case very nicely. He says there are four reasons why you want freedom of thought and freedom of speech and you want liberty. Because for one thing, unless you question something, how do you know it's really true? Second, he says, it may be partially true. And only by critiquing it do you get more of the truth. Third, he says, unless you vigorously debate something, you don't really believe something. I mean, if somebody says this is true, if I just accept it without discussing it, or without challenging it, I myself will not believe it. So he said, the only way to develop passion is, to, is for it to be, uh, you know, if, only by contesting it do you yourself come to believe it to be true. And finally, he said, there are some things, for example, there's a lot of passion around free speech that only comes when you reflect on it. So he says, for all these reasons, liberty is extremely important. And then there is an immediate tripwire. He says, but, this is ironic. Remember, he was writing in the time of the British Empire. He says, but some people are not ready for liberty. And he says, then they need a tyrant like an Akbar or a Shalmane. And I'll talk about Akbar and how different he was uh, to Mill even. And he said, and the irony is that he was pointing to the British, that he said that British, the Indians were not ready for free speech necessarily. And therefore, the subtext was that the British need to be in there to civilize, so to speak, the Indians before they are capable of uh, any sort of liberty like this. And the same thing with Locke. You know, we teach Locke in our programs, uh, you know, his essay, his letter concerning toleration, but it's really between different Protestant sects. He does not extend this free speech to Catholics and he does not extend it to atheists. So it's very important to be aware of these tripwires we tend to glorify a lot of um, uh, uh, traditions. And by the way, uh, we have to be critical of all traditions, including the Indian one, as, we, as I will point out. But uh, the Western tradition is very well discussed, but the tripwires and the nuances are lost. And we tend to forget how, limited, how, how many limitations these uh, ideas of free speech, you know, how, how they came with that. Now, Immanuel Kant, one of the great philosophers of all time, in 1798, he published a book called The Conflict of Faculties. This was his second last book. And he just happened to uh, publish this because uh, it was a response to uh, the new emperor. He, of course, was very fortunate that he lived in the time of uh, uh, Frederick the Great. But he just passed away and his successor, Frederick William II, he had initiated repressive measures against German universities. So he wrote this book called The Conflict of Faculties, which is not very well known at all. Uh, Derrida gave a lecture at Columbia um, some years ago, and so people started paying attention to this. But it's very interesting that the king charges Immanuel Kant with uh, blasphemy. He says, how dare you disparage Christianity and the scriptures, uh, correct it, failing which you must expect unpleasant measures for your continuing obstinacy. This is Immanuel Kant being upgraded by the king. The, and as late as 1798, Kant replies, he said, I am not criticizing. By the way, he backtracks. He says, I am not criticizing Christianity. I'm just saying that there is natural religion which will look very good if it has certain features, and I'm only comparing that with Christianity. So I'm not really criticizing that. So he also backtracks. It's very interesting. These are all uh, important incidents in the development of the Western tradition of free speech. Now, British universities. So we talked about uh, Athens. We talked about... Uh, 
Germany. Right up until 1871, there was a religious test to being a faculty member at Oxford or Cambridge. Unless you subscribe to the whatever it was, 19 artic no, 39 articles of incorporation of the Anglican Church, you could not be a faculty member at Oxford or Cambridge up until the reform of 1871. Not only that, this was relaxed in the early 19th century. Until the early 19th century, you could not even graduate if you subscribed, if you did not subscribe to the articles of the Anglican Church. In particular, Charles Babbage, you know, the famous Charles Babbage, who created the first uh, computing engine, uh, the first programming machine, he could not graduate because, you know, his thesis uh, was deemed to be blasphemous. So, uh, right up until 1871, in the leading, you know, that was not so long ago, there were very clear tests, religious tests of what you could or could not do. All right. So, this I've already touched upon. And right up until 1918, Bertrand Russell, first of all, he was thrown out of Cambridge in 1916. Again, one of the great philosophers of all time. Uh, he, because he was a conscientious objector, because he objected to the First World War. And then he was actually put in jail for six months because uh, he insulted the United States as a wartime ally. And that's 100 years, exactly 100 years ago. When was Pignani in Britain? Around the same time, wasn't it? But but was that? Huh? Did he write it in jail? Good question. I don't know. <clears throat> You're thinking of Principia Mathematica. Principia. 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 Yes, right. No, you're right. He wrote it after. No, after he wrote it after he came on. That was Whitehead and um, Russell. So that so that was a little later. I think that was in the 20s and 30s. So um, so. Right up until the 100 years ago, there are severe limitations on free speech. Severe limitations on free speech. And so I want to touch upon a book that Timothy, Timothy Garton Ash, also an Oxford professor, he just came out with a book uh, on free speech, which I think uh, doesn't go into many of these issues that I'm touching upon. But he says something very interesting. He says in a talk that he gave at the Jaipur Literary Festival in 2017, where he introduced his book on freedom of speech, he said, the future of free speech will be decided in India. Very interesting. I won't go into why he says that. but uh, And let me, let me support at least that part, that there are new perspectives that India has to contribute. So I'm going to share some new data with you that I think will be eye-opening. It was for me. So the, the context of this is Max Weber, you know, the, um, the, 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 the person who essentially invented sociology. Uh, he said uh, in 1923, when, so this is when the first uh, fruits of Indology were coming to bear in Germany and in Britain. And he said, uh, for long periods, the toleration towards religious and philosophical doctrines was almost absolute, with no limitations in India. And it was infinitely greater than anywhere in the, in the Occident. And I've, I have the German quote there as well, because I think it's often not uh, the nuances are sometimes lost, but as early, uh, but as uh, 100 years ago, just when the West was still wrestling with issues of academic freedom, Max Weber wrote this uh, piece uh, about, uh, about India, where he talks about, right in the beginning, on page three, in fact, in the German edition, he talks about how, by contrast, India has had absolute freedom of speech. So now I'm going to share with you uh, some data, huge amounts of data that I thought I would share with you. So these are, so the first thing to remember is that there are eight great classical religions in the world, right? Four of which had their birth in India, and the other four found a very nice, respectful home in India. But then there are many other traditions, uh, so we refine it partly because uh, these uh, eight traditions, and there were many others that, that existed at different points in time, so I've used these symbols, uh, which are reasonably obvious. Ajivikas, you know, they disappeared 2,000 years ago, but were an important force, um, uh, you know, several thousand years ago. So these are the symbols, uh, fairly obvious ones for most of them. But Ajivikas, we didn't quite know what to use for them. Buddhism, you know, the, ch the, the Dharma Chakra, the Om for the Brahminism, the goddess worship, Jainism, Judaism, Christianity, sun worshippers, um, which often were uh, close to Zoroastrianism, the Parsis, Shaivites, the Shaktism, which is a variation of Shaivites, moon worshippers, wind worshippers, Vaishnavites, Zoroastrianism, and Islam. 
So these are the symbols. I hope uh, you can remember these. These are reasonably obvious. And what I did is that I took a, all the, I f created a dynastic list, essentially from 7th century BC to 12th century AD. And I'll tell you about why that cut off. Because uh, that is the encounter of India with Islam. Then things change very dramatically. And uh, there are some very interesting experiments that I'll talk about later, some very interesting uh, um, ways in which Islam then reacted. But that's a whole different topic, so I won't um, talk about it today except for two sub-instances. But, but essentially what I did is that we took data on 45 different dynasties, and mostly this is epigraphic evidence. So hundreds and hundreds of epigraphs, uh, which are inscriptions written in stone or copper plate grants about religious patronage. So who are these dynasties patronizing, right? Because in the West, until uh, the Enlightenment, and in particular the French Revolution, there is one religion that state, the state patronizes, and that's it. And either it uh, does not patronize the others, or it actively, actually, actively prevents the propagation of those religions. By contrast, uh, in North India, starting with the Mauryan Empire. Now, what is interesting is that if you look at Chandragupta Maurya, by the way, the Mauryan Empire, this is 5th century, um, uh, sorry, 4th century BC to 2nd century BC. Chandragupta Maurya starts as, he's a Jain. His son, Bindusar, is an Ajivika. His grandson, Ashoka, is a Buddhist. And his great-grandson, uh, I forget his name, he's again uh, an Ajivik. So basically, in terms of the faiths that the, the, that the kings are professing, it changes. The king may have one faith, the son may have another faith, the daughter may have another faith, the wife may have another faith, and it changes. And there is evidence for support of five separate faiths. Kushan Empire, uh, which succeeded the Mauryan Empire, they support all these different faiths. They support Shaivism, they support uh, Zoroastrianism, they support goddess worship, uh, we will, uh, I have slides pertaining to the coins that the Kushans put out. Fascinating stuff that people have not put together. There is goddess worship. He is supporting uh, Zoroastrian fire worship. He's supporting Shiva as an expression. He's, and he has uh, titles in multiple languages, in Persian, in Greek, in Sanskrit. He has all these titles that as the protector of all of these religions. Uh, the Shakas, and you can just see, I won't bore you with all the details, but there are 13 dynasties of North India over uh, uh, almost a 1500, 1800 year period. And you see how many multiple faiths they support. And we can, I can give you chapter and verse of the epigraphic evidence that we have compiled uh, that, that indicates this. So 13. One more question. Yes. So um, what was, for example, the Kushana Empire's uh, state religion? What was their religion? It is, no, there, there was, it, it's not clear what the state religion was. It's because he takes on these, see, in the case of Chandragupta Maurya, while he's supporting the others, he's very clear that he's a Jain. Yeah. He's very explicit. But in the case of Kushan, the, uh, of Kanishka, for example, he, uh, he, he has, he, you see him supporting the Shaivites, you see him supporting the sun worshippers, you see him supporting the fire worshippers, you see him supporting um, uh, the goddess, uh, the worship of the goddess. So it's very difficult to say. And he takes on the titles. So he'll say in Persian, Shahan Shaho, the king of kings. This is now first century BC, right? And then he says in Greek, he is the Basileus, the king again. And then in Sanskrit, he will say he is the uh, uh, Maharaja Dhiraj. So, uh, so he is, there is plurality of religious expression there. Very clear pl plurality. And uh, if we have the time, I'll pull up the coins I think I have in a subsidiary slide. Yes? So does support in this context mean active support or the absence of? No, no, act this is active support. By the way, the passive support is always there. This is meaning there is evidence that these people are either of that religion or have some family of that religion or are supporting that religion. So if there are five things, it means there is one, at least one of those, that is, Either I am that, or I have a family member who's that, or, I'm, or, I, or there is active inscriptional evidence that I'm supporting a place of worship of that faith. So this is active support. Passive support is all there. 
I mean, there's no, there's very little evidence of religious persecution. Now, this is Northeast India. Again, 13 dynasties. This is not taught in history books at all. These are the dynasties in the eastern part of India, the Varman. You know, some of these dynasties I had never heard of. But there's deep inscriptional evidence and the support for religious um, plurality is all there. Uh, this is Assam. This is Assam, Odisha, uh, uh, the Northeast, uh, Manipur, all of these, absolutely. The Northeast and East. Northwest and West, same thing. It's pretty interesting. Maitrakas of Vallabhi, for example, uh, so, so this, these, they were the successors of the Guptas on, in the West. It's interesting, the, the father is a Shaivite, the daughter becomes a Buddhist and endows a university. And uh, there are other, uh, there is evidence of uh, supporting Vaishnavites, there is evidence of supporting Jains, they were big patrons of Jains. In fact, the second uh, council of the Shvetambar Jains happens in Vallabhi, actively supported by the king. So all that is there. Um, in fact, this is missing the Jain symbol. So they also there's a fifth one as well. Uh, we put this together just day before yesterday. I think uh, my RA put, you know, we had tables and tables of lists and they were not very evocative. So we thought we'd use symbols. Is it Chalukyas? Uh, early and uh, Chalukyas. Okay. Chalukyas, 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 yes. So there is evidence that they supported the Jains, uh, the Shaivites, the fire worshippers, and goddess worship. Which means there is active evidence to show that they patronized these religions. Active evidence. This is not that we think that they may have, but there is hard evidence, meaning either inscriptional evidence on stone or on copper plates. So, it's, uh, so this is that. And South India, now it becomes even more interesting. Now, uh, in addition to all of those religions, Buddhism, Jainism, you have uh, Judaism. If you look at the, the Kula Shekharas, and if you look at the Chera dynasty, these are from Kerala. So the Jews have a, uh, there's inscription from 1000, exactly 1000 AD, there is evidence of uh, the, Chera, uh, the uh, Chera dynasty, because they were in power in the year 1000, of giving grants to Jews for, for their places of worship. And the Islamic, you know, the, the, they came very peacefully. In the north, they came uh, through war, but in the south, they came very peacefully. And there is active evidence of kings giving grants to Muslims for their places of worship. And in the case of Judaism, it's actually giving them revenue from villages. So it's on a continuing basis. So this, again, was an eye-opener for us, just compiling this list of another 11 dynasties. So all in all, we, I've just shared with you in sort of symbolic form data on 45 different dynasties that covers the full time and space over India. And there is no exception to this pluralism that we find. These are stunning results. And I apologize for asking questions. Sure, sure. Excited about this. Was this all epigraphic? Yes, almost everything is epigraphic because that is about as, I mean, it's literally hard evidence. So it's like it's a very minimal set of evidence that from which, in other words, it's, there could be a lot more, in other words. No. In other words, it could be lost records. Yeah, oh, of course. So. This is the lower bound. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, this is the lower bound. Oh, hugely. Because um, for one thing, well, paper doesn't survive, but stone survives, right? And copper survives. But nonetheless, they are small. They're not actively, so this will, this will be something that will be dug up from some archaeological dig, or it'll be on the temple wall somewhere. In other words, this is not spoken word history. This is not spoken. This is written history. Okay. And because this is, this is most trusted by archaeologists and historians, because this was written not afterwards, but this is contemporary evidence, right? Because this is part of the affairs of state. So 45 dynasties covering all parts of India, all times, all time uh, zones, uh, I mean, all periods. And you see this. So why is this true? So, so the Indian tradition basically says, very much like Mill, Vade Vade Jayate Tattva Bodha, the Sanskrit uh, summary, the four arguments that Locke has, this summarizes that. It, that it's only by constant Vade Vade, you know, through constant dialogue and constant discussion. Yes. Choose one and go 
typically they would choose, well, so, so, uh, so there is one example that we have of somebody who embraced four religions, and that was Kanishka, the Kushan emperor, right? So I, in fact, maybe towards the end, if I have some time, I'll, the beautiful coins, the gold coins, uh, which, which document this. You know, in one case, he's dressed as one of one faith. In another case, he's dressed as a person of another faith. And so, uh, so there are a few of that, those, but by and large, you find one person at one time embracing only one faith. Sometimes they change, you know, so they may be X today, tomorrow they may be Y, and that was completely comfortable. And it was also very common, as I mentioned in the case of uh, Maitrakas, the father would be of one religion, the children may be of another, the wife often was of another religion because she would often come as an alliance from another state. So that is also very clear. So, so, the, 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 so this is well understood, and, but, but the most interesting thing is uh, this uh, dialogue between uh, a Greek king, Menander, Menandros as he was called, or Milind as he was called in, uh, in Sanskrit. So there's this great text called Milindapanha, where he, uh, this is now, uh, you're talking about uh, second century BC. And this is uh, a, a picture of Menander taken from, um, um, from one of the digs. And so he is having this conversation with this Buddhist monk, Nagasena. So, so he says, talk to me about spirituality. Talk to me about faith. So he says, how do you want to discuss it? Do you want to discuss it as kings do? Which means if I don't like your opinion, I will put you in jail. Or do you want to discuss as scholars do? When scholars talk a matter over with one another, then there's a winding up and unraveling. One or the other is convicted of error, and then he acknowledges his mistake. Distinctions are drawn and contradistinctions, and yet thereby they are not angered. Thus do scholars, O king, discuss. And so he says, okay, you choose your parameters. If you're going to discuss this in your court, it's going to be one, but if you're going to discuss it as scholars, it's going to be another. And he says, the king says, very well, it is a, as a scholar, not as a king, that I will discuss. And this is a beautiful text. If you haven't read it, it's all, it's out of copyright on the web. Take a look, fascinating, fascinating uh, discussions that, that are happening. And this is perhaps just a, a glimpse of that. So how did this happen? I mean, so, th so then you have to wonder. I mean, I also wondered, why is this happening in India? And so then you have to look at the philosophy. So th I've just shared with you the history. And you already know the philosophy of free speech in the West. I've shared with you in rough outline Lock the Lockean arguments. And you know, I can, we can talk about the Greek uh, sources and um, the Enlightenment and, and the Renaissance and all of that. But how did it happen? So basically, uh, this is the key, the, the, the Rig Veda, the oldest text in India, the oldest religious, philosophical, spiritual text, whatever you may call, call it, one of the oldest texts in world history is the Rig Veda. And in um, the first mandala and one, 164th hymn, 46th line, uh, there is the famous uh, line in Sanskrit, ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti, that is truth is one, but the wise express it in multiple ways. And uh, what is interesting is that what to what is one, sages give many names. Or uh, what the motto of America is, a pluribus unum, that is very much this idea. So uh, now this idea occurs, it's not just in this hymn, this occurs dozens of times in the Rig Veda. And it puzzled the Indologists who first encountered it, in particular Max Muller. Why? Because they had, uh, uh, as Mueller says in 1872, he said, this is, uh, this is amazing because although many gods are invoked, uh, the, the, same, uh, the same god may be the chief god now, but in a different hymn, another person would, another god would be the chief god, and this god would be the subsidiary god. So you can put, it's like choosing a coordinate system. You can put zero anywhere. And the origin is somewhere, and then the others can be elsewhere. And what is interesting is that there is no suspicion of rivalry and no idea of subordination. It's not that if there are six deities that you look at, and in the Rig Veda, there is, I, I will talk about that. It's like you can make anybody uh, the, uh, the, um, the center. And he contrasts this by Greece and Rome. He said, in Greece, Zeus is the chief god. Everybody else is subsidiary, or Jupiter. Zeus and Jupiter, uh, uh, Zeus, uh, du uh, 
uh, Jupiter is the son of Zeus, so it's the same thing. I mean, it's not a Deus Peter, as it was called. But is Deus Peter, is that just a generational leader as opposed to a pecking order? Yeah, there, there's, no, there's no pecking order, it's the same. It's like father and son, right? And so Mueller, uh, uh, Max Muller was so surprised by this that he had to come up with a new name. He called it henotheism or cathenotheism. That is, the, that is worship of different gods treated as one. Now, this, this line, truth is one, but sages call it by many names, was called by Swami Vivekananda, the Magna Carta of religion. Because this is what allowed India to appreciate multiplicity of points of view. It's right there in the foundational text. Not just there. In, this is something even more interesting in the main Upanishad. You know, there are uh, 10 principal Upanishads out of, uh, and there are many more minor ones. But the biggest one is, as the name indi itself indicates, the, the great forest Upanishad, Brihad Aranyak Upanishad. And there's a beautiful line there which is stunning. So, uh, so uh, Shakalya, Vidagda Shakalya asks Yagyavalkya, you know, who's one of the great uh, uh, philosophers of his time, in fact, the second philosopher in history, and he says, how many gods are there? So he says, first, 303, uh, then 3,000, sorry, 3,003, 303, 33, 6, 3, 2, 1 and a half, and 1. And, you know, he covers the entire range of uh, philosophical traditions, monism, qualified dualism, dualism, trinity, uh, you know, the fact that there are six principal Vedic uh, gods, then there are 3,033, all of those, he, can, he says, really, you know, sometimes I may talk about many, but really they're all the same. And so I've, the Sanskrit as well, in case you're interested. And uh, the, so, so it's not just the Upanishads, then Ashoka, who's a Buddhist emperor par excellence, he then, in his 12th rock edict in Girnar in Gujarat, you can see it from um, the third century BC, he says, may all sects be aware of the multiplicity of points of view and be welfare centric. So this is, I've taken the Sanskrit equivalent, Sarva Pashanda Bahushruta Kalyana Gamascha Bhave Yur Iti. Bhave Yur Iti. That may all be aware of the diversity of viewpoint. This is what he's telling his subjects. And by the way, Ashoka patronized multiple religions, we know that. And he's saying, may they all be aware of each other and the diversity of points of view and be focused on, focused on the welfare of individuals. Okay, I, uh, so basically the other thing is, uh, I, I will skip that. Um, now here is something else that is very, very interesting. This is a Chinese dialogue that happens. So, so Zhuan Zhang is the person who came to get the Buddhist scriptures from China. This is now six, he came, this is when he has returned to China. He's already spent over a decade in India collecting the manuscripts, he goes back to a hero's welcome, kind of like a Christopher, Chinese Christopher Columbus, except he came looking not for a trade route, but he came looking for scriptures. So the Chinese classic Journey to the West is still celebrated, and in fact it was made into a movie as recently as two years ago. So he was both a historical figure and also a mythical figure. And what is interesting is that we have a letter preserved from him, and that I have to read to you, parts of it, from 654 AD, because this is just stunning. And so this is preserved in Chinese and in Uyghur, and it was first published in Chinese in 1923. Um, and this was translated into English by Professor Tan Chung a couple of years ago. And it's a letter, it's, a, it's an exchange of letters between two of the most prominent philosophers, uh, religious people of their time. One was Pragyadeva from the Mahabodhi monastery outside of Varanasi. And uh, the other one is, of course, Zhuang Zhang, the famous Chinese scholar, traveler, philosopher, saint, uh, who's, uh, you know, after whom a magnificent temple exists in Xi'an in China. Is that the same as Yuan Sang? Yuan Sang, that's the one. Yeah, that's the same one. That's the modern spelling. Uh, or Yuan Sang, as he's often called in, um, uh, in earlier. Uh, so what had happened is that in, um, a, a year before, a year before his, he left China, Pragya, uh, uh, Pragya Deva and Zhuang Zhang had engaged in a public debate. Now it's important to realize 
that uh, Pragya Deva belonged to what was called the Theravada school of Buddhism, or Hinayan, as it is called. Whereas uh, Zhuangzang, having come from China, belonged to the Mahayan tradition. Now, they are far, the difference between Hinayan and Mahayan is far greater than Protestantism and Catholicism for the simple reason that the main texts that the Mahayanists uh, look at are texts that are not even recognized by the Theravadins. So their scriptures, while, they, while the Mahayanists respect the scriptures of the Hinayanists, but they have their own set of scriptures that they emphasize a lot more. It's a little bit like Mormonism. While the Mormons respect the Bible, but they have their own Bible that they respect even more. So think of uh, Mahayan, Mahayanists and Hinayanists, or Mahayanists and Theravadins, as they should properly be called, as sects which are far more different than Catholic Catholics are from Protestants. Now in 653 AD, there was a big public debate that was organized in Kanyakubja in North India by the then king Harshvardhan, who was one of, again one of the magnificent kings. And the two people who were arguing for three days in public before thousands of people, many of them royalty, many of them philosophers, on the relative merits of these two religions. Remember, can you imagine the Pope and the Anglican Archbishop arguing about the relative merits before thousands of people in London, uh, and that to 1,500 years ago? I mean, of course, Anglicanism didn't exist at that point, but you, you get the picture. Now, so they participated in a debate, and of course, then Zhuang Zhang goes back, and then he gets this letter from Pragya Deva. Why? Because Pragya Deva has a pang of remorse. Why? Because he says, at that point, in order to defend the truth, there was scant regard for personal feelings, thus, we, thus there were clashes. But remember, these are debating clashes. But as soon as the debate was over, we did not take each other amiss. Uh, so basically, what had happened is that Pragya Deva and Zhuang Zhang, over the course of three days, got he into heated arguments. And that is only natural, you know, when you're, defeat, when you're debating something that, is, that you're so passionate about. And so Pragya Deva then sends a letter of apology and he sends uh, uh, two, two uh, garments, two fine cotton garments to Zhuang Zhang and says, Your Excellency, I'm very sorry that I raised my voice when I debated you. Please accept this as a token of my gratitude and a token of my apology. Zhuang Zhang then writes back. He says, uh, uh, in order to, yeah, so he then says, he says, he also writes back and says, I also apologize. My voice also got raised. But, and then he adds something very beautiful that I, you know, it just tickles me no end. He says, you, sir, this is Zhuan Zhang addressing Gyanashri Mitra by return post. You know, he's replying to his mail, which, by the way, took many months to reach him in China, obviously. But, so he says, you, sir, are profound in scholarship, eloquent in speech. So he's praising him. He says, you're a scholar of the highest order. Mahayana Buddhism surpasses all other schools. This is his own, Zhuang Zhang school. It is regrettable that your reverence has reservations about it. So he's saying, how come you're so smart, but you're not a Mahayanist? And he said, there's still time. Accept your error and change your faith to Mahayana Buddhism. Otherwise, you may live to regret it. Now, I mean, you don't give up the fact that you like your religion more and that you want the other person to follow it. But this is symbolic of how these debates used to happen. And remember, these are very different in terms of their traditions. And yet they could find a way to, uh, to, to debate like this. This is just stunning. This is, again, hard evidence because it exists in Chinese and Uyghur languages. This letter became apparently quite famous, and this, uh, so this is uh, that. Now, very interesting, if you think that religion was the only thing that they were criticizing, uh, let me just share with you, because I don't have time, and I want to, there's still some material that I want to quickly cover, uh, that, uh, that uh, they also, at Nalanda, the famous uh, university, there was a deep social critique, not just of religion, so, so they say, uh, anybody who believes in the Vedas, in the world creator, in the crest of purification through ritual bathings, the arrogant divisions of castes, so they're criticizing the caste system, social, social order. The practice of mortification to atone for sin, these are five marks of the crass stupidity of witless men. Seventh century 
logician Dharmakirti, who's very famous. So he's just criticizing the social order at that time. If, if social is the only thing, uh, scientific order also, this is now fourth century AD, this is now Patliputra, this is now Aryabhata, who by the way, like Galileo, had come up with a heliocentric model, this is fourth century AD. And yet, uh, the, the, uh, the, the text basically begins by saying that when the methods of the five Siddhantas, meaning the five systems of astronomy that were prevalent, when they gave conflicting results, then Aryabhata comes in and he sets things right. So he overturns their way of doing things by proposing a new model. And yet he's celebrated as a Kulapa, the head of an institution. And so even for, for religious, there was religious tolerance, there was tolerance for social critiques, there was tolerance for scientific critiques. And this again uh, is there from the manuscript itself. So then very briefly, I want to touch upon Islam. Now again, Islam was a very interesting encounter in India. Uh, and what is interesting for me is that there are two strands that I want to pull out, which are going to be very important in the dialogue for the future. Because Islam, as has, all, has been recognized, is still, still coming terms, to terms with modernity in a way that the other religious traditions have, have done long ago, right? So, and Akbar, and this is from the late uh, 16th century, uh, one of the great uh, Mughals, as it were, the most magnificent of the Mughals, he had come up with uh, a new religion. Today, he would be uh, crucified for it. I mean, if he ever became an apostate as a Muslim king, he created his own religion, deen e ilahi by taking elements of the Sunni, Shia, Sufi, Vedanta, Jain, Zoroastrian, and the Christian traditions. He also took elements, and the, and the, and the book that his uh, biographer writes, Abul Fazl, about how he integrated these religions is phenomenal. I mean, he describes each religious tradition. This is a Muslim king and his biographer describing all the different faiths and how he picks out the parts that he likes and creates his own religion. Of course, it dies with him. But uh, the idea is that all of these traditions, and this is a metaphor that I'm going to share with you in a minute, that all of these points of view are like points on a circle and he takes all the best things from each and he concentrates that in the middle, in the hub. And this is a metaphor that the Rig Veda also uses. That uh, uh, when they talk about these multiplicity of points of view, they talk about all these points of view arrayed on a circle. And the axial god, whoever it is that they are focusing on, that him is focusing on, goes in the center. So it is as if symbolically that god becomes the origin and everybody else is arrayed around it. And you can change the origin. Sometimes it can be Indra, sometimes it can be Mitra, sometimes it can be Varuna, sometimes it can be Vayu, and so on. Yes, yes. So you're absolutely right. If you have some images, I'd love to find, uh, I'd love to pull those here from Fatehpur Sikri if you have something illustrating that. And then the most interesting uh, uh, Mughal uh, who died young, he died in the Battle of Samugar and Aurangzeb won. And Aurangzeb was a disaster. I mean, the Mughal Empire perished with him because of his repressive policies. I mean, today, uh, and Darashiko was the older brother of Aurangzeb. Darashiko did something which was unprecedented in human history. Uh, he, first of all, translated the Upanishads into Persian, 53 of the Upanishads into Persian, which then were translated into Latin, which then were translated into French, and then deeply affected uh, Schopenhauer and the German Enlightenment deeply affected Upanishad, they were affected by Upanishadic thought. And the English translations affected the New England transcendentalists, right? Thoreau and Emerson, who were called Boston Brahmins. I mean, it's very appropriate that we're sitting here. Um, Alcott. Huh? Alcott and, other, and others. So anyway, Dara Shikoh does something very interesting. So what he does is that he creates, he writes a book in two versions. He calls it Majma ul Bahrain in Persian and Samudra Sangam in Sanskrit. So he writes the same book twice, once in Persian and once in Sanskrit, for two different authors, calling it the merging of two oceans. Just as in, the, in Kanyakumari, the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea come together into the Indian Ocean, that is symbolically what he is writing. And what he does is that he actually creates, so we, I had a, an RA go through the book and create a table of correspondences. He takes Vedantic philosophy, the Upanishadic thought, 
And he takes Islamic philosophy and he just lines it up. He says, okay, in Vedanta, this is this. In Islamic philosophy, this is this. He just creates a table of correspondences. It's like you're doing a parallel uh, analysis. So anyway, uh, this is what he does. Now, this is what I want to end with. <clears throat> Again, this is a fascinating story, and then I want to leave some time for discussion. This is a 5th century Jain text called Dva so it's a mouthful, Dva Dashara Naya Chakram. What it means is the 12 spokes of the wheel come together in the center. That's what you can do in Sanskrit, right? You can come up with a big word that puts in several things. So what he does, this is now a 5th century AD text, a Jain text. He says, I'm going to take all the philosophical systems that exist. I think there are several dozen of them. And he puts them into 12 boxes. I won't go into this. I don't fully understand the boxes. It's one of the most uh, dense uh, philosophical texts ever written. Uh, essentially, he has hundreds of quotations of all the philosophers that he was familiar with. And he puts them in 12 boxes. And he labels these boxes. I won't go into the details. And he puts, and he has box one criticize box two. Box two criticizes box three. Box three criticizes box four. And so on down the line, they all criticize each other. And ultimately, he takes the Jain view of multifacetedness of reality. The fact that, and then the, the metaphor there, I'm sure we are all familiar with that, the six blind men and the elephant. They're saying, in effect, that all the 12 boxes are partial reflections of the elephant. And unless, and you know, we are six, we are multiple blind men or, or women, and we are touching the elephant in different parts. So whoever touches the ear thinks it's a fan. Whoever touches the, um, the side thinks it's a wall. Whoever touches the trunk thinks it's a tree. Whoever touches the tail thinks it's a broom, and so on. So this is exactly the idea. So uh, what is interesting is what he's doing is he's saying that uh, my faith combines the best aspects of everybody. So I'm not negating the others, but I'm just saying mine is better. And the point is that the Buddhists do a version of this, where they put Buddhism in the center, and they array the others around and say, look, they are incomplete for that reason. And then the... Uh, uh, the the uh, Vedantins do the same thing, where they say, we are the integrating force, and the others are partial reflections. And this is how they basically conduct their debates. And Mallavadi was so, and by the way, this text is, uh, was lost. He apparently became so good at this kind of analysis that he vanquished all, there were rules of debate, right? I won't go into those. That he defeated all his, arg his opponents of other religious traditions using this particular framework. And then this text was lost. It was only in the Tibetan script that it was available. And one of the Jain monks spent 30 years, and he learned 16 languages to be able to translate, including Tibetan, to be able to translate this, to, to reconstruct this text in Sanskrit from the Tibetan uh, script, the Bhota Lipi. So anyway. Uh, this text has never been translated in any language. It's only available in Sanskrit. The first half translation in Hindi is about to come out. And it gave me a headache when I started to read it. It's the densest philosophy you can possibly imagine. But nonetheless, the key uh, of the method is this. And I won't go into what are the categories by which you criticize. The, that actually is uh, Bhartri Hari's Vakyapadiya, in case you wondered. Very much like Wittgenstein's uh, linguistic analysis. So I won't go into that. So think of analyzing Heidegger using Wittgenstein. That is what this, uh, this text does. So, uh, so the, the principle that I want to propose, the Indian tradition of free speech is the principle of axiality. That is, it's perfectly OK for you to say that your faith is better than that of others, but you don't negate the others. I mean, the fact that you are of a particular faith probably constrains you to say that my faith is better. Everybody has the right to say that. But the way in which you say that is not by negating the others, but by saying where you think the others are deficient. 
Okay, so maybe one particular faith emphasizes worship and divine uh, grace. Whereas another faith will say, no, it's personal responsibility. There is no such thing as grace. That is a cop out, that is a shortcut. So you can criticize, you know, I can say that you believe in divine grace. I believe in uh, good works, right? I don't believe in divine grace at all. And you can have an argument and we can both construct an argument saying I'm central or you can construct an argument saying you are central. So this is the principle of the chakra kendra, the center of the circle. So you have a circle and you have the circle. So this is a, a term that I've coined, chakra kendra, or you may call it axiality. And this is the final slide. Uh, the Indian traditions of free speech meant, particularly with regard to religion, which was the most difficult and the most contentious aspect of free speech, even today, that state is neutral with regard to religion. State has no religion. But the king has a religion, or the queen has a religion, and others are free to follow their religions. And, the, and not only that, it's not a separation of church and state, the state actively fosters the expression of religion because it's considered to be a part of culture, the highest expression of culture. So even to this day, the state in India supports the Muslim pilgrimage Hajj, as well as the Hindu Yatra in the Himalayas, the Amarnath Yatra, and so on down the line. So which is very different from what you find in Europe and North America. Uh, and full freedom, mod then the Ashokan principle was moderation. So he says, don't ignore the others. And when you criticize, you criticize moderately. One of the rocky dicts of Ashoka that I didn't go into. And he says, and then he says, the mark of an educated man is that he or she is a bahushruta. Bahushruta means literally heard from multiple, heard multiple things, or somebody who's heard multiple arguments, right? The bahushruta, it means somebody who's heard multiple things. And the purva paksha, you have to know the opponent better than himself or herself. You have to describe the opponent faithfully. You cannot say, you cannot take shortcuts and uh, you have to almost understand the opponent better than, uh, better than uh, uh, he or she understands himself or herself. You have a right to say you're better, more fundamental or axial, but there is diversity. So let me pause here and uh, thank you. Floor is open. Yes. When I compare to the more Western, like a Roman or like that, yeah. they went, they conquered, they converted the faith and everything to the unified way, rules, revelation, religion, everything. But when it comes to India, it's like a small kingdom, you go conquer it, up to Ashoka. Ashoka was the one who was like a more dominant way of unifying. Yeah. It was diverse within the community itself, different faith, different caste, different community, different religion. So, uh, kings don't have a choice except to have a diversity to rule uh, because religion was never a ruler like Islam. It was never a power. I think that is one part. But, um, but like yeah, but also partly because right from the earliest times there was so many, there was so much diversity of faith that it never occurred to anybody to say that there could be only one. Because it was common knowledge that there were so many different ones. And they vigorously debated each other. They vigorously uh, propagated their faiths. People routinely uh, moved from one to the other. And uh, therefore, uh, it was considered to be a matter of private conscience, now, something that the state did not interfere in. And to the extent that the state got involved in religion, it supported everybody. Yes. So how is it that with so many thousand years of uh, free speech, the last four years, India is progressively becoming a Hindu voice or a Hindu extremist voice? So, um, and very important for many other religions, foods, cultures. People are getting lynched because of the beef. I mean, there's, you know, there's so many. So, so it is, I, I think what is happening is um, 
a realignment of forces for sure. So as a result, so what is happening is that uh, a lot of the power structures that existed in the universities, it's, it's basically a fight for political space in a large measure. While certainly you have seen that friction, you know, when, when there's a realignment of forces, my view is that free speech is actually alive and well. While it is true that these, you cannot ignore any of these incidents that have happened, but I'd like to believe that they were, they have largely been something which happened in a particular isolated, I don't, I wouldn't say four years. This was a more like a year, year and a half during which this happened. And I think it's already on the wane. I don't think we've seen anything in the last six months or so, or five, a couple of months for, for sure. Anything that would give a call, undue cause for concern uh, with, on, with regard to that. I, uh, having said that, I think it, it will be important to reiterate those principles of free speech, principles of uh, free choice in terms of food. I think it's going to be very important to indicate that, and I believe uh, uh, people from all sides have done that, including in the ruling dispensation. And it's a good thing that uh, people have taken the government to task for not being proactive enough, in some cases, of uh, restoring the rule of law and bringing uh, the perpetrators of some of those unfortunate acts to book. So my purpose in doing, you know, in um, focusing on this is to really focus on the plurality. That force in these matters is not the tradition in India. No, I mean, that I understand what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But plurality seems to break down when uh, forces get realized. I was in India till last year. Yeah. And I saw it happening very soon. For example, um, How so? I think the, the sense of persecution is, is much higher. Can, can I say something? Yes. I think this is a wrong concept. Individual, even a Muslim imam, one of the earliest ones, he suggested that 95% of Hindus are secular. And it is just what you're seeing, what you see in newspaper, because most of the information comes to newspaper. It is biased. You go to the, see, I come from a Varanasi, and I know, I talk to people and on phone, I'm always in touch, and they say that, that there is a small portion which are, uh, is maybe fighting, with, and it is more politically instigated. Uh, for example, I'll give you only uh, two days back example. In Banaras is the university. There was a very small incident. Right. I think that, that takes us. They were, you know, they were uh, going from one college to their hostel, and they reported that they were assaulted. It was the mistake of the institution, and uh, say, Roy Chancellor, he did not take action immediately. Then immediately, Congress party was there. Mm -hmm. Raj Babbar came, uh, people from the Socialist Party came, the Communist Party came. And by the way, that's the, that is the strength of India, right? And they made a big issue of that. By the way, it's a good thing. You have your personal view based on phone calls and speeches. I too have a view based on my, I lived there and actually experienced this. I'm not debating a person. Yeah. Can I make a suggestion? I was in a discussion two days ago and we had this exact same discussion about this country, strangely enough. So if I, let's return to the Let's return, yeah. Topic let's do that, that. let's right. do that. I think all I, all I can say with regard to that is that vigorous, uh, you know, it's very important for us to be, in, in fact, I'm very glad that you raised this I issue. We're talking about free speech and debate. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, no, I agree, I agree with you. I, it's, it's very important that you raise that issue. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. and. Please continue to raise it. I will continue to raise it because, uh, you know, as they say, eternal vigilance is the price that we pay for liberty. So I think uh, 
if even one citizen of India feels constrained in terms of expression of uh, free speech or religion or culture, then that is unacceptable. And I think uh, uh, the, the good news seems to be, I hope I'm right on this, I cannot be sure about this, that it's very much on the decline and that there was this phase where the forces were realigning and therefore some energy was misplaced and misreleased. Hopefully, that is going to be a thing of the past. And I hope that if there are... I believe at the point, but by the way, the same thing has happened with Christians in India, with Adivasis. All the minorities there for some time. Have been the yeah, so there, there, there have been... Age, there, and by the, way, by the way, that has happened. That has happened, and uh, we, hope, we hope that all this is a thing of the past. Is all I can say. We've run out of time. Yeah. One, one more question? One more? Okay. So on the yes. Question. Yes. On that last concept, unity and diversity, that strikes me. Um, that's a logical concept. Um, and I'm wondering if, at least it has an equivalent in logic, I'm wondering if this toleration of multiplicity that you see in Indian culture right. gets yeah. reflected at the deeper level of Indian logic. I wonder if there's, I mean, you would expect um, yes. classical principles in, in the Indian tradition to be a lot more relaxed than the ones that you see in Western tradition. That is absolutely true. You, the, you wouldn't see the law of non-contradiction. Yes. You wouldn't see the law of identity, yes. the yeah. principle of bivalence, yes. uh, which rules out the possibility of two things being true at the same time. Yeah. It would be really interesting to see your, your toleration. Right? Yes, you're absolutely right. By the way, uh, I, I would say that that is, not, uh, that is absolutely true. And that is in particular, Buddhist logic is three valued, not two valued. And the Jain logic is seven valued. Seven. Seven. And uh, the best, so until for a long time, uh, the uh, scholars in the West had a hard time comprehending the lack of the law of the excluded middle, right? Uh, so uh, Janardhan Ganeri, uh, who's a first rate logician as well as a Sanskrit scholar, he has actually said that these questions, uh, Ganeri, I'll write it for you, G-A-N-E-R-I. -A -A -E so if you look at Professor Ganeri and Sanskrit and logic, you'll get his works. So he actually makes the point that uh, all this is reflected in the logic as well. And not only that, it's only in the 1920s that the Polish school of logicians starts to look at similar questions. In particular, uh, I think uh, he, he has a whole list of uh, logicians that he mentions. And, uh, he, and this is how he frames it. And I think I, I would like to share that with you. Uh, and that is, a, and it's, I'm thrilled that you actually mentioned it because ultimately we have to develop a whole new calculus of how we agree to disagree, right? It's not enough to say that your views are different from mine. That is not enough. That is, so to speak, an easy way of avoiding discussion. You know, it's like saying, OK, to you, to you, your way, to me, my way, and let's go our own ways. I think that is not very helpful. I think what is important is that if we agree, if we disagree on many things, can we find the core of what we agree upon? Right? And can we then act on that? So the idea, so the whole idea, so Ganeri's point is that the whole point of Jain, the whole, the way of looking at Jain logic of Anekant Vad and also this, this uh, axiality principle, the chakra kendra that I talked about, is by saying how you can take any two points of view and by going to the center find things that are common between them. So that if you and I are negotiating, let us say there are 12 parties on the table, if you and I are negotiating, how do we find the common ground between the two of us? If you and I are negotiating, how can we find the common ground? If he and I are negotiating, how would I find the common ground? So this actually is about the logic that would be required if you have incomplete, incompleteness of perception. And then how do you build partial perspectives and still agree on certain things? So he calls it, I think, I don't know if he calls it this, but this is how I think of it, or maybe he calls it that. The logic for living in a world where we, where we agree to disagree. Right? Because you have, to, you have to also allow for the fact that when perspectives are partial, that no matter how much we discuss, that we will not come to an agreement on everything. But the real question is,
can we come to an agreement on certain things? And if so, what does the logic of that look like? Yes. Yes, yes. And that is precisely what the Jains tried to do. And Ganeri has tried to bring these questions front and center in the logical discourse. So he's very prolific. Uh, you may want to look at his, and he actually has papers on logic, formal logic, uh, with this point of view. I'm not a logician, so therefore I cannot uh, comment on the quality of those, but from what I understand, they are reflections of a very high quality. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed uh, the, the questions. Thank you.